Well, today we continue in our sermon series of what would Jesus do today? What would Jesus do today? Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 through 48 will be our reference text. And I'm going to be honest with you. Today's sermon, it's about what would Jesus do today with injustice? And this was really tough this week. And I'll tell you the reason why. In case you have not heard, last Wednesday we found out that three of our seven units had been robbed of copper. Our, of our uh, heating and AC units had been robbed of copper. So, you know, I was a Marine before minister, so immediately I'm thinking of, hey, we really need to do something. So to write this sermon, I, I, I don't, you know, it's one of those things that we all struggle with. It's one of the things that we all have a problem with. So today, it, it, I think it's, it's perfect timing for us to talk about it. So what would Jesus do today with injustice? Let's go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our message. Father, we do thank you so much for all that you give us. We do thank you for grace and for mercy and for love and for forgiveness. Because, Father, while these are the things in life that are so important for us individually, sometimes we struggle showing them back. So we ask that you would be with us today, Father, as we talk about this important matter in our life. We ask that you would open our minds to hear what your word would be, Father, and that most importantly that we would be challenged to what needs to change, but then go that step further like we're called to and make the changes. Bless us, be with us, and may we always honor you with our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, needless to say, if you know anything about Corey Ten Boom, her life and what she endured in her life is absolutely amazing. She and her sister Betsy were actually in the Ravensbrück concentration camp during World War II. Now, the guards at the camp ridiculed her sister on a daily basis. One day when Betsy, of course, when they were all together, Betsy, Corey, and the other prisoners were digging a hole, and they were doing it with a shovel, and a guard was mocking Betsy because she couldn't hardly lift a whole lot on a shovel load because she was so small and frail, and she was weakened by illness. She couldn't quite get as much as everybody else did, so a guard finally came over and took her shovel, grabbed a handful of dirt that was on it, and began to show everybody and began to mock who she was and what she was doing. And then he began saying very vile things about her sister. The Nazi guard then took a leather strap and slashed her across the back, across the neck, and across the chest. And Corey, who was younger than her sister Betsy, now was raging with anger, grabbed her shovel and began to move towards the guard. But Betsy stopped her in her tracks. Although Betsy's shirt was quickly starting to turn red from the cuts that she had received from the straps, she told Corey, keep working, just keep working. She covered up the cuts with her shirt, and she looked Corey in the eyes and took her by the shoulders and said, don't look at the cuts, look at Jesus only. Years later, she had a chance to remember her sister's words, like up close and personal. She was speaking to a women's group in Munich, Germany, about forgiveness and all that she had been through. And after she finished... A man who had walked in, even though it was a woman's group, had walked in and sat in the back and was listening intently, and she could tell, began to approach her with his hand extended out to shake her hand. And he said, yes, it is wonderful that Jesus forgives all of us for our sins, as you say. And when she looked at the man's face, she was repulsed. Because standing before her with his hand extended was one of the guards at the concentration camp that she had been at, her and her sister, and he was one of the ones that constantly humiliated Betsy. Corey's hand froze. She was unwilling. He didn't recognize her, but she was unwilling to reach out and take his hand, and she was horrified at the memory and her inability to forgive. So she silently said a prayer, Lord, forgive me because I cannot forgive. But she said, as I was saying that prayer of forgiveness, I began to feel my hand loosen up. I began to feel my hatred start to fade a little bit. And I finally reached out, embraced the man's hand, and I forgave him as Christ had forgiven me. Now, the fact is, when we hear a story like Corey Ten Boom's, when we read that some 70 years later, it is still an emotional and moving story, especially when you consider Betsy's plea, look only at Jesus. Because that's hard. Whenever we're in times of of terrible, terrible situations like that. But we hear those words in that story and we cannot help when we hear it to think about faces ourselves. Now, some of those faces are faces of somebody that maybe inflicted pain on you. 
It may not be a, a, a guard at Ravensbrook. It could be somebody in your life, but somebody that inflicted pain on you. Maybe somebody that committed a crime against you. Maybe it was physical. Maybe it was emotional. Maybe it was both. But you picture those faces. There are some, needless to say, who have walked away from a cemetery burying a loved one, yet only to see a drunk driver walk away unharmed. And that's painful. We others see faces that, of neglect. Maybe it was a parent or, or maybe it was somebody that was too busy worrying about a certain lifestyle. Maybe they're trying to keep up a certain lifestyle or a certain image in their life. And they realized that you just weren't that important at that time. And you felt that pain. Or maybe a woman who put her husband through school to become an attorney only to have him after he graduated leave her and leave the children as well. And when they went to court, he said, the kids were your idea, not mine, and I really never loved you at all. You see, we have a tendency when we talk about stories like that to see faces of our own. And some people recall having maybe even their reputation damaged by people saying things that just weren't true by people that you don't even know. A minister named Mike Cope actually tells a true story about one of his friends who he and his family were on vacation. And when they were on vacation, they got up that Sunday morning and they, they visited a local church and they went there only to hear the minister attacking him in the sermon. Now, the minister had no idea that the, mini, the visiting minister, the one he was speaking about, was there. And the reason why is because he had never met him and he didn't know what he looked like. But here he sat with his family being ridiculed from the pulpit. It was devastating to his children. Injustice hurts. It stings. It can blister self-esteem. And we begin to wonder why in the world people in this world would ever do something like that on purpose. But unfortunately, the answer is really kind of hard to find. I had a person many years ago actually write a letter to the leadership of our church about something that I was doing. My crime was that I was too blunt with our youth. Because I had spoke to them about drinking and about premarital sex and how it was wrong. And wanting to cave into peer pressure would not only destroy their relationship with their mother and father, but especially with Jesus. And I was too blunt. I was also, of course, falsely accused by a person one time when we were trying to build the new church. That I really didn't care about people. And that I was a liberal preacher who enjoyed contemporary music. Now, I'm amazed the music part didn't bother me, but I'm amazed that I would ever be called liberal from the pulpit. But nonetheless, I've received threatening letters in the mail, anonymous, of course, because always the most threatening letters is always written by the guy named Anonymous for standing for biblical beliefs that really aren't popular in the world today. But you've been there. The fact is, it's different circumstances, but it's the same story. You've had somebody attack you, say things about you, maybe even people that you don't even know speak against you, because the fact is, while you're serving a purpose for that person, you're good and everything's fine. But when you stop serving that purpose, all of a sudden, there comes a problem. And people begin speaking out against you to damage your character. So what do we do about injustice? Well, there's three possibilities. Three possibilities. One is you can ignore it. You can ignore it and just sweep it under the rug and forget all about it. But you and I know that is a problem and it doesn't work because the bump under the rug gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, it consumes the entire room and then it explodes. And then it's worse than it ever was. That's the first thing we could try. The second thing is we could retaliate. We could decide we're going to retaliate. We could punch back. We could flash the headlights at the guy in the fast lane that just won't get over 45 miles an hour. We could do that. We could honk our horn. We could have a party and not invite a person because we intend to hurt them by not inviting them. We could cut off communication. We could start rumors and gossip about someone, try to get them fired from a job. This is part, or the, part of the reason why the movie Unforgiven by Clint Eastwood, if you remember back in the early 1990s, was so popular because people can identify with wanting to get even Nobody likes to live a life where they feel that the score is not even. W.H. Arden actually wrote it this way when it comes about it. It was a poem that he put together to reflect basically the standards this world wants us to live by. And this is how it reads. I and the public know what all school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. Pretty simple. But retaliation, by the way, doesn't get us anywhere. 
The concept of an eye for an eye leaves everybody's eye socket swollen and blood all over the floor. It doesn't accomplish anything. Every time we repay evil for evil, all we're doing is putting coins inside the evil machine, and it just keeps right on churning and chugging along. So that one probably won't work either. And then there's the third option, we can forgive. And, and by the way, this third possibility is really the one that basically opens a person up who is following Jesus Christ to a peace that can only be brought by Christ himself. As a matter of fact, it's a miracle working of forgiveness. Because you see, when we've been forgiven about something, it really sets us free. However, if we're being honest, this is also the hardest for people to do when they go through a terrible ordeal. As a matter of fact, it's hard for people to do in general. So, I want to go ahead and talk about this this morning. We're going to break it down like we normally do this week when we talk about it. So let's start off with our first point this morning. And our first point is simply this. What did Jesus teach or what did he talk? What would he talk? Matthew chapter 5 verse 38 says, You have heard it said, or you've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. I want to stop there for a second because Jesus says not only an eye for an eye is the way that the world is teaching you, but... He says, it's also the way some of your religious teachers have taught you to do. It's the things they've taught you, but it's not right. That's why he starts off with, you've heard it said, and then he follows it through. This isn't right. You see, the religious leaders of the day had been teaching, and at the same time, by the way, trying to use the Bible to back their teaching in Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Leviticus, because in those books, you'll find phrases like this, show no pity, Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. But what Jesus is saying is the teachers of the law has missed the point of what God was saying there. The words that God gave there had two major reasons that he said them. Number one was this, to provide a proper punishment for a crime that was to be determined in court. Not by a mob of vigilantes wanting to get even and wanting to make things right. And so they do it their own way. It was for proper punishment. The second thing it was said for was to provide protection for those people that were not given a proper punishment for the crime. In other words, we need to make sure it matches the nature of the crime. For example, a foot for a foot, using that. As opposed to, let's cut the man's head off because he broke her ankle. That's not a proper way to do it. So the two things that those words were meant for were completely misinterpreted. So what Jesus is actually doing here is taking the people back to what God's true intentions were. So listen to Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 through 42. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek as well. And if anyone wants to sue you to take your shirt, offer your coat also. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, Jesus is saying, respond to evil with love, insults with blessings, give a smile to a person who's frowning, forgiveness for bitterness. We are to be a people that works to reconcile when divisions are there and where we find trenches caused by pain, we're trying to build bridges over them. That's what we're called to be. And if that were the case, if people actually did that, could you imagine how much easier it would be to be in a traffic jam? Could you imagine how much easier it would be to stand in a long line or family, dealing with family issues or congregations? Could you imagine how much better life would be if we actually thought like that? Because then Jesus adds this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't the pagans even do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, every good Pharisee, knew that God had commanded them to love their neighbor. Every good Pharisee knew that. But some assumed that by loving your neighbor, what God really meant was to love good people. 
to love good people. So if that were the case, they continued to assume and then in turn write their own version of the Bible, which a lot of people, by the way, tend to do from time to time, that if I love good people, well, then it's assumed that I must hate my enemies. And so they began to teach that. They were determined and they taught that the only true way to be faithful to God's law was to hate For example, the people that were the half-breed Samaritans, it was okay to hate them. The tax collectors, it was all right to hate those guys. And the Romans, we can hate all the Gentiles, no big deal, it was all right to hate them. Now, why in the world was that okay and justifiable? Because they called it righteous hatred. And that, my friends, was okay. Let me ask you, have you ever felt that way, that righteous hatred was okay? Now, by the way, Remember, we always define our own righteous hatred. But that righteous hatred is okay. And were you ever told when you were young and growing up that there were certain groups of people that it was okay to hate, even though you knew nothing about them and you had no idea who they were? You see, righteous hatred hatred is a perfectly tailored suit that always fits perfectly, no matter what, whenever you want to put it on. Now, why is that? Well, because it allows me to like and to love who I wish, and it allows me to hate, ridicule, and dislike those who I don't want to. It fits perfectly. It fits with things like maybe a family member who has just simply drained the family emotionally and of all the financial resources, and you find that you want nothing to do with them anymore. Maybe a competitor whose idea of fair advertising is ridiculing you and making false accusations against you and your product or your character. Or maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a teacher or a church leader. Maybe it's a spouse, a former spouse. Or maybe it's somebody that's made it their life mission to simply make you miserable. You see, that perfectly tailored suit of hatred fits perfect whenever you want it to be. Righteous anger is a fuel that can burn forever with anyone you consider and have defined as an enemy. It'll never, ever slow down. But the fact is, that's not at all what Jesus wants to lead you and I into. Because his word calls you and I to love. See, Jesus wants us to refrain, if you will, from insisting that there be an eye for an eye. He calls us to love to love like God loves, to treat all people equally and work equally as hard at relationships as you would anybody else. But God sends, it says, rain to the just and the unjust, to the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I will not stand here and pretend that this is something that's easy to do because it's not. It would be an absolute lie to say that it is. And I will be the first to admit, and you've heard me say it a hundred different times, I struggle with anger. Now, I'm a whole lot better today than I was in the past. I'm a whole lot better today than I was when I graduated high school, when I went into the Marine Corps. But the idea is, I think everybody struggles with that. And I have found that in my life, it takes time. But I have also found that it takes avoidance of that which incites me. Now, what's amazing is simply this. We say this all the time to our children, to our friends. Look, if you have a problem with alcohol, don't go to the bar. Don't go buy it. If, if this person's always enticing you to go, to go do something that's wrong, don't go around them. Well, see, I find that that works well in my life. That those people in my life who entice me to become angry and frustrated and really want to just simply go back to my Marine Corps days, I, and I just stay away. Because you see, to love like God wants us to love is to forgive like I've been forgiven. Frederick Buckner actually says it a whole lot better in his book called The Magnificent Defeat. This is what he says. The love for equals is human nature. Of a friend for a friend, of a brother for a brother, it is to love what is loving and lovely and the world smiles. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, for the sick, for the misfits, the failures, the unlovely, This love is heartfelt compassion, and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who have succeeded where we fail. To rejoice without envy with those who rejoice. The love of the poor for the rich, of the black man for the white man, of the white man for the black man. The world is bewildered by its saints who can do that. 
And then there's the love for your enemy. Love for the one who does not love you, rather mocks you, threatens you, inflicts pain. The tortured's love for the torturer. Now that's God's love. And that love conquers the world. So, what can we do about injustice that we, you and I suffer? How do we handle that? How do we respond when people lie about us or, or try to hurt our family or treat us unfairly? Well, Jesus answered and he said, forgiveness. Matthew chapter 18, verses 22 to 20, 21 and 22. Then Peter, <clears throat> then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, let me stop there for a second because I believe that Peter probably asked this question because somebody had already reached number seven in that day and he wants to lay the hammer down. And he just wants to make sure that it's okay with Jesus. But Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Then Jesus adds this in Matthew 18, verses 23 through 34. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to repay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children be sold in order that they might repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will repay you everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the entire debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw this, what happened, they were outraged. And they went and they told their master everything had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger. His master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owes. Now listen to verse 35. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. You see, when we offer forgiveness to others, it actually helps you and I in several ways. In forgiving others who have wronged us, we recognize that our, we ourselves have at times in our lives, or at least we're reminded that we have the capability of being unjust to others, and we need forgiveness for actions in our life as well. We are reminded that we live in a fallen and a broken world, by the way, and it has fallen and broken people, including ourselves, and that we have the capacity for evil, which, by the way, puts us in need of God's grace, love, and mercy. Because here's the deal, if we do not recognize that we are capable of evil and injustice and that because of that we just as much need forgiveness and grace, then when we attempt to do that for others, it'll be false forgiveness and grace with victimizing language. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's nothing worse than a person that tells you they forgive you and in the very same breath turn around and remind you why they are forgiving you, what you did, because that screams hypocrisy. If we are going to be forgiving people of God, we better recognize that we ourselves, what we are capable of, and that the grace, love, and forgiveness that God offers us, we also need to give back. We cannot forget the words that Jesus taught us to remember in our prayers. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Does that describe your life? I mean, the fact is, if we're being honest... And I pray that you're always at least honest with yourself. If we're being honest about it, we know that that is a real challenge in all of our lives, which, by the way, will take us to our next point. So how did Jesus live? Well, Jesus' life matched his words. How did he respond when it came to injustice in his life? The fact is we've already established and we all know well to be true that there is absolutely no better example ever to follow than the example of Jesus Christ. No one has ever been treated more unfair than Jesus was ever treated when he was here. No one has ever been more forgiving than the person of Jesus Christ. And no one had a greater forgiving spirit than the person of Jesus Christ. Remember the story that we find in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 54? When Jesus is heading to Jerusalem preparing for the crucifixion, he sends messengers ahead and all that to get stuff and everything ready for the Passover meal. And because of that, there's racial tension, if you remember, all the time between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Samaritans wouldn't welcome them there 
Now, James and John didn't handle this issue very well. And you could tell by the words that they used in the Bible that they were boiling mad. They basically say in layman's terms, Jesus. Now, by the way, this reminds me, unfortunately, of something that I probably would do. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? That's how they respond. So what does Jesus do when that happens? He responds to them by reprimanding them, not the Samaritans. And why? Because he said, you should know better. They don't know yet. You should know better. They don't know yet. However, there's no clearer example than we see at the cross of Jesus Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote these words. The cross is the only power in the world which proves that suffering love can avenge and vanquish evil. Yet, you and I both know that what Jesus did that day who Jesus stood up against, when they took him in to charge him with the crimes, they actually paid false witnesses to come in and speak against him. The only man in the universe who steps out of eternity and into our world who come to only do good was also accused of only doing evil. But that was to be expected, at least according to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. I want you to think about that for a second. Looking right in the face of the purest hatred there was, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Later, the apostle Peter reminds Christians that we should not retaliate. Why? Because of our example, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 23. This is what you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth, and when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So you have to, To understand, Peter learned that lesson personally. After disowning Jesus three times publicly, he probably thought, I know he thought, what in the world? Why would Jesus ever forgive me for what I did, let alone why would he ever use me to bring people to salvation through him? But that is not at all what happened. Jesus, needless to say, fully aware of what Peter was going to do, offers Peter mercy by saying these words in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon... Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. I really do not believe that any other aspect than following Jesus Christ will take more work, more prayer, and more practice than this one thing of forgiveness for any of us. And I will tell you, because the world lives by revenge only. You see, to the world, revenge is extremely satisfying. It's like, it's like candy that you enjoy. You take a couple of pieces and you just can't stop. And you just keep going with it. It's like the bumper sticker that you and all, I know that we've all seen. And maybe you've even had it on a vehicle. I don't get mad. I get even. But the fact is, beware of both of these things because both of them are wrong. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because they're like poison. Revenge will eat you from the inside out if you let it. Which will take us this morning to our last point. Escaping cruel unfairness. A great American hero, editor, school teacher, and preacher, Elijah Lovejoy, left the pulpit and returned to the press to make sure that his words reached more people. You see, the fact is, quite frankly, the Civil War may have been averted and peaceful emancipation of the slaves if, and it could have been achieved, if more men like him had sat down and actually talked things over. But after observing one lynching, Lovejoy was so committed that he was forever uncompromisingly against and for, against slavery, but for the abolition of this awful sin of slavery in our country. Mobs brought action against him time after time, but neither this nor threats on his life would ever stop him from what he had determined that God had put in his life to do. Repeated destruction happens to his presses, but he would repair them and keep right on going. And he once made this quote, If by compromise is meant that I should cease from the duty, then I cannot make it, for I fear God more than I fear man. Crush me if you will, 
but I shall die at my post. And he did, four days after making that statement. At the hand of another mob, and not one of the cowards in the mob were prosecuted, were indicted, or were punished in any way, shape, or form for the murder. As a matter of fact, people that had actually come to love Joy's aid were prosecuted and put in jail for what they were doing. They were obstructing justice, they were told. One of Lovejoy's assassins later became the mayor of Alton, Illinois, which was one of the saddest times in that state's history. However, you know what's most amazing about that story is that there was one young man who was deeply moved by Lovejoy and his desire to stop slavery and the martyrdom of Lovejoy. He had just been elected to the Illinois legislature, and he was an unknown uprising person named Abraham Lincoln. With all the threats on his life, with the mob threatening to kill him, what was it about Mr. Lovejoy that he would not stop doing what he believed God wanted him to do? It's actually simple, actually. Betsy Ten Boom, Mr. Lovejoy, keep your eyes on Jesus. And by the way, when we do that, you don't have time for revenge. You don't have time for anger. You only have time to do what you believe God wants you to do, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, just like you and I are called to do. Now, the fact is, I want to make sure that we understand something this morning before we head out of here. In no way, shape, or form, no way, shape, or form does forgiveness of someone or some action mean that you condone it, mean that you accept it, or mean that you're okay with what happened. Or forgiveness in no way justifies the pain you felt. The atrocity that was done to you. Forgiveness is not about becoming the best friend with the person that has harmed you or hanging out with them or anything like that. As a matter of fact, the best thing sometimes you could ever do is avoid them. So forgiveness is not those things. What forgiveness means is that you are moving forward in your relationship with Jesus and you will not be held captive any longer by animosity, hatred, or anger for somebody else's failure. You're going to forgive them and move on. You may never go around them again. If you're like me, you probably won't. Forgiveness, you see, is freedom. Because I'm not going to hold it anymore. Friends, today, I invite you to receive the greatest freedom by the grace that God offers you in faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism. Bury your old self and receive first for you the greatest freedom you could ever have, and that is freedom from your sin. Have it taken away. But maybe today you're already in Christ and you struggle with this area of forgiveness and, and mercy and all that. And listen, we all do. If anybody says, no, that's the easiest part of being a Christian, I would have to challenge that. Maybe today is a day that you say, you know what? I need to get better at that. I need to take it more serious. Maybe today is a day of change. I don't know. But you do, and Jesus does. Just prayerfully consider where you are.